On Tuesday night at our place, we're going to uh, teach you guys a little bit more how to use the story track. And I'm going to get a little bit more, uh, uh, I guess, uh, practical and just give, just show you how I would do it and maybe maybe do a little bit of rehearsing. And, and so uh, I want to encourage you all that can to come Tuesday night and, and just kind of get a refresher on this and, and let's learn together as we prepare for uh, for Thursday night and the days to come. But... but um, as we look at chapter 4, uh, I just kind of want to remind you of what's been going on. The Holy Spirit came down on Pentecost upon the, the 120 in that upper room. He filled everyone in the room. He anointed each one of them with the Spirit of God. He filled them with the power and equipped them to be proclaimers of the gospel, to preach the word. And they went out, and Peter preached, and 3,000 souls were saved. And we don't know exactly how many days it's been, uh, but Peter and John then in chapter 3 started going into the temple to, to, to worship and to pray. And uh, they, they healed this lame man that's outside the temple gate. And uh, immediately he's healed. And he jumps up, and he starts worshiping with them and praising God with them and he starts following him. He clings to them. He goes on into the temple. They're there in Solomon's porch and a crowd gathers around and everybody's just amazed at what's happened to this man who they all know has been a cripple for 40, more, 40 plus years and now he's walking and they think evidently that Peter and John have done this and Peter begins to boldly proclaim, hey, it's not us. It's that Jesus, you know, that you crucified that's healed him. You know, your Messiah. You know, that, and so that's the message that he's been preaching. And so uh, we, we've got up to this point, and, and now in chapter 4, the, the story takes a little bit of a twist. And so, if you will, stand with me again just briefly in respect for God's Word. This one of the title of the message is God at Word. And God has been at work here in Acts. The Holy Spirit is working through God's people. And, and, and that's the way God's working today. And so here in Acts chapter 4, beginning at verse 1, we read get from God's Word. And as they were speaking, that is Peter and John to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of them came to about 5,000. That's the word of God. May God add his blessings. The reading of his word, y'all can be seated. God at work. God at work. Um, it's amazing, really, when you start seeing what God was doing through his people in the book of Acts. And today, we're still in this age of the church and God is still working through His church to do His work, to, to redeem people, to build the body of Christ, to build His kingdom for a day of complete restoration that we have to look forward to. And, and so God is at work. Now, as we look at our text this morning, I'll give you a little bit of preview on into the sermon uh, that's me there somewhere. I think my cord's a little bit bit off, but I saw you looking around. So, but but we we uh, uh, when we think about God at work, I'll give you a little preview. What we're going to be talking about this morning are uh, we're going to, we see in this text a couple of reactions that people give, and one of them is people will react with a, a negative reaction, and 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 they will seek to reject and oppose us. And the second reaction is that people will believe and be saved. We see that here in the text. And so what I want to talk about, thinking about it, are reactions. And, and as I was, I was thinking about that uh, this morning, I, I thought back about when I was a young boy, my cousin Sandra, she was here with us a, a couple of weeks ago. Oh, I've got this thing wrapped around or something. It's pulling. Sorry about that, guys. But um, when, when my cousin Sandra, she was here with us a couple of weeks ago. Some of y'all may have met her. But she was married to... Uh, Freddie, uh, a, a man named Freddie, I'll just leave it at that. And Freddie was, and he, and he still is, a big man. He, he's over six feet tall and well over 200 pounds. He, he's, all, he's been like that for years. And, and, uh, but he played basketball for McMinn County High School. And, you know, he's just a fun guy to be around. And, um, but on a few occasions on our farm, I, I, going toward Watts Bar, where, where I grew up the first part of my life, you know, I'd seen Freddie. When we were out just to grab a, a, a wild chicken snake 
like out of the, out of the chicken coop. He'd just grab it by his hands and hold it, and and uh, he'd let it crawl on his neck and up his arm. I mean, he just kind of, you know, freaked me out a little bit, you know. <laughs> but, but that's just kind of the way he was. And, and, and he obviously didn't react the way most people do with snakes. You know, you know most people react in a completely different way when they say a snake. But, but so when I was about eight or ten, you know, I, that's when all this was going on. I don't remember exact age, but, but I got wind from somebody that, that Freddie was scared of mice. And so one day when he was at our place, I, I, I had a little rubber mouse that looked so realistic, especially for the 70s, you know what I mean? <laughs> it looked like a realistic little, little mouse. And, and um, I got this little rubber mouse, and I snuck up behind the chair that he was sitting in, and I, I strategically placed it, you know, just a few inches away from his foot. And then, then I walked around, and I just started talking about how I'd seen a mouse in the house. And I could tell he was starting to get a little nervous, you know. And, uh, and after a few minutes of kind of working it up, um, you know, I, I, I pointed to that rubber mouse next to his foot, and I said, there it is. And in one fell swoop, immediately, this large young man who handles snakes like a charmer, in one swooping motion, jumped up from sitting down on the couch to standing on the couch cushion, uh, to the arm, and then trying his best to get up on the back of the couch, on the wall, and screaming at the top of his lungs like a little girl, kill it, Carolyn! <laughs> Calling for my mama to kill it. And just dancing, and, and you know, not the kind of reaction you'd expect to get from such a big guy. You know, I mean, it, it, was, it was so hilarious. But, but after he calmed down, you know, I asked him, I said, Fred, I said, I don't understand how you can handle these snakes when you're scared to death of mice. And he said, I can't stand them. They're, they're little beady eyes, you know. And so, hey. <laughs> but now for most people, whether it's a mouse or a snake, you're going to get a reaction, aren't you? Most people. You're going to get some kind of reaction. Am I right? Now, some of you, you know, we'll just let you maybe share your own sentiments with that, but in much the same way, when God is at work and the gospel is being proclaimed, you're going to get a reaction. People are going to react in some way. And as we work our way through the book of Acts, we, we, we'll see quite a few different kinds of reactions and, and responses to, to uh, people, to God and, and His work. And, and as God's children and as His church, we're commissioned to do His work. We're, we're commissioned to take the gospel to all people, making disciples of them. And so every week we're trying to challenge you guys to interact with people and we're trying to teach you how to do that and, and to how to share the gospel and, and to begin the process of discipleship. Because when you share the gospel, when you commit, when you share the gospel with someone and you start having those spiritual conversations to talk about Jesus, you're beginning a process of discipleship. And you're trying to determine, is this, they may not commit to Jesus that first time. And most of them won't. But when you start those conversations, the Holy Spirit of God begins to work. And either they're going to become receptive and become disciples of Christ, or they're going to reject that message ultimately and refuse that. But, but it's a process, and, and it's up to us to share that. So this week on Mays Avenue, we're, we're praying that God gives us an opportunity to, to make that kind of impact to, to, to when we share the gospel. And, and um, uh, you know, on a night when evil is celebrated, we pray that God comes down. Amen. You know, you can expect a, a few different actions when you share the gospel. And, you know, but that's the work that God's called us to do. So, you know, I want to ask you do, you, do you want to please God with your life? Do you want to do those things that only that bring Him glory and bring others into the kingdom of, of heaven? Do you want to bring others into the kingdom of God? You know, uh, it, it, one thing that stirred my heart early on when, when I, I wasn't really doing anything for ministry was that thought of, of maybe going to heaven but going empty-handed. You know, I, I want to bring folks with me. That's what God's called us to do. And, and if that's your heart, if that's your desire, if you want to please God, you want to live that life, you want to make disciples, you want to be as close as you can to God, then it, this message has, it has a word for you. It can help you learn what to expect as you seek to do the work of God. Allow the work of God to do. Allow God to work through you. So 
the way really we ought to put it. But, and so in our text today, we, we're going to see two common reactions to God at work through us. So just two, maybe a little bit shorter sermon than, than anybody else. Uh, no amens on that, but uh, hey, number one, one of the reactions that we're going to get, we've already, we've already talked about it, but is that you can expect some resistance. When we begin to share the gospel and seek to do the will of God, you can expect resistance. And as we journey through this New Testament book that, that uh, we, we've received by Luke through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, we see these faithful men and women of God at work and, and God working through them and, and how they often encountered opposition. The event here in, in Acts chapter 4 is just the first of many. And we'll see that as long as we continue to preach through Acts. In fact, you may not know this, but I wanted to share this with you. Uh, you know, most of the 12 apostles, those disciples that, that uh, followed Jesus, the 11 that remained, most of them that we know about what happened to them, they all died as martyrs. That means they gave their lives for the cause of Christ. And they were killed uh, refusing to renounce their faith in Christ, basically is what that means. And so uh, both Peter and Paul were apparently uh, executed in Rome for their Christian faith. And, you know, James, uh, the son of Zebedee, was put to death by Herod Agrippa the first. Andrew uh, is, uh, is said was crucified in Greece. Uh, legend says that Matthew died a martyr's death in Ethiopia. Uh, Thomas is said to have been martyred in Persia or in India as he served as a missionary there, taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. And James, the son of Alphys, was eventually stoned to death by scribes and Pharisees, probably in Jerusalem. And so we see this time and time again. And over the years, we read about in church history the stand that faithful men and women of God have taken, planted their feet firmly on the Word of God. And at almost every corner, when anybody tries to do something significant with the gospel and tries to do God's work to let God work through them, there will be, and there always has been, opposition and resistance. And so we can expect it. In our text today, we see this beginning. So we've already rehashed it a little bit, and, and we've talked about how Peter and John were going in the temple to pray. They see this man who's been lame from birth, and, and he asked them for money, but instead of giving them money they, uh, through the power of God, they healed him, and he began leaping and walking and praising God with them in the temple, and this crowd gathers around him, and Peter begins preaching, and he preaches that message, and he tells them that they're the ones that are responsible for crucifying Jesus, their Messiah. And most of these people were Jews who were looking for the Messiah. And, and probably he's going back to the Old Testament. He's bringing out those texts showing how Jesus fulfilled the Messianic prophecies. And so many of them are probably the Holy Spirit of God's already at work in their hearts. Drawing them to him as they hear this news. Because we, can't, we, we don't draw anybody to Jesus. We don't draw anybody to God. All we can do is tell them the story. That's all we can do. We can tell them the story and through the message that God's given us, He draws them in. And that's what Peter and John were doing. They were just telling the story that God told before the foundation uh, of the earth from Genesis 3 about this one who would come and redeem man who's fallen. That's the message that they were telling them. And so this crowd was gathered there He's calling them to repentance, revealing that hope of all sinners that's found in grace and mercy and that love of Jesus. And so now in verse 1 of chapter 4, we see that as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees that came upon them. That, that the Greek word came upon them implies that it was sudden. They just all of a sudden, here they were, they were upon them and and it wasn't a good up on them. You know, they wasn't there to, to give them a hand clap. All right? You know, and these priests were probably a part of the ruling council. You know, the, the part of the, the, the Sanhedrin. The, the priests and, and the, the, the scribes, the, the Pharisees and the, and the scribes and the Sadducees, they, they made up this ruling council. And, and the captain that's talked about here was, 
was likely the caretaker of the temple area, the temple complex. And so that was his domain, his rural area there. And so, so they, these were the people who came. And, and the Sadducees, it, it almost seems like they were leading this attack to me. And I may be reading in the text, but, 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 but these men, the, the Sanhedrin, these priests, these Sadducees, this captain uh, of the, the, the temple area there, um, they were disturbed at what Peter and John were preaching. You know, I mean, they were disturbed for a few different reasons. Number one, these men had no teaching credentials. <laughs> you know, if you look down in verse 13, it says that, that they were confused because these men, being from Galilee, they were unlearned and ignorant. You know? Uh, and, 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 and so, uh, uh, you know, some of, we can identify with that. I, I've been accused of being the same thing from time to time. But they had no seminary degrees. They had no mentoring certifications. They had no preaching license. They didn't have any ordination certificates. And so here they were preaching and teaching. And so these religious men were like, who do they think they are coming into the temple and teaching? But I'll tell you who they were. They were men anointed by the Holy Spirit of God to teach and preach the very message they were teaching and preaching. Amen. That's who they were. <laughs> oh, man. And so are we, the redeemed saints of God, anointed by that same Amen. Spirit of God to do the same work of God. Every one of us who believe. And so, not only were they disturbed because these men had no teaching credentials, but they were concerned because these men were teaching in the temple. So not only were they teaching a message that they felt like they weren't qualified to teach, they were teaching in their domain. <laughs> you know, they were on their turf. You know, it's almost like a gang or something. You know, and, and, and they were probably a little jealous because these men had drummed up a crowd probably bigger than any crowd they'd ever drummed up. You know, and so I, that was probably raging them a little bit. And, and, and so that was another reason. Then the Sadducees... They were riled up because they were the, these disciples were preaching resurrection, and, and the Sadducees, you see, they, they were a conservative group. Uh, they rejected all the new scripture of the Old Testament, all the prophets, and and the only the only part of the Old Testament that they accepted was the Torah, the Law, those first five books of Moses, Genesis through Deuteronomy, and so that was all they they accepted, and they denied all miracles, and and especially detested the teaching of resurrection. And that's why they were sad, you see. Yeah. And so if you want to remember what the Sadducees believed, just remember they were sad, you see, because they didn't believe in the resurrection. But that's who they were. And, and so then, furthermore, they were all irate because Peter and John were not only preaching the resurrection, but they were preaching the resurrection of Jesus. Yeah. A man that they had themselves had had part in making sure he was put to death. And so now these men were saying he, he was alive. And, and, and they were not only saying Jesus was alive, but they were upset because they were saying that Jesus was the Messiah and he was resurrected. And so that was bad news for them because they, for, they really feared more than anything probably the repercussions of a political overthrow of the, the foreign lords. And, you know, they had a good deal worked out with the Romans, you see. And, and they were getting their, their uh, pockets padded and, and, and had a nice arrangement, if you know what I mean. And so any kind of restoration of a Davidic king would likely uh, usurp their authority. And they didn't want any part of that. And so uh, a, a lot of these men, the Sadducees, probably a lot of the Pharisees, they didn't want the Messiah to come. Because it was going to upset their way of life, you see. And so now they were saying that the Messiah had come and they had crucified him. And it just set them off. And so they arrested him. You look at verse 3. It says, you know, they had authority to arrest him since they were in the temple. And um, they held him to mourning because obviously it was inconvenient to bring a council together at night. No different than it would be today. You know, just waiting for, for the court time the next day. And so what we have here is a negative reaction. Resistance from religious elite. That's what we have. You know, 
over the years of my ministry, uh, of my involvement in ministry, I have to confess that the biggest resistance to carrying out what I believe that God called me to do has come from religious leaders. That's where the resistance comes from, unfortunately. That's where it came from here. And, and, and you know, as a pastor, I've received more resistance uh, from folks in the church who are in leadership positions than I ever have from folks outside the church. And that's the, unfortunately, that's the way it works a lot of times. God help us. But that's the way it is. You know, and while I haven't experienced anything close to what these disciples experienced, in one church I pastored, we were experiencing significant growth and had won more people to the Lord and baptized more than they had in, in years, in the last few months that we were there. And one of the deacons became frustrated and he, he kept, he was upset because the church was changing. You know, and, and, and it wasn't like it used to be. And he was constantly uh, asking me what was wrong. What's wrong with our church? And I'm like, I don't know. Well, you know, there's a lot wrong with our church, but I'm liking what I'm seeing, you know, is what I was thinking. And it became apparent to me that he liked small numbers and, and he wasn't interested really in leading people to Jesus and building God's kingdom. He wasn't interested in that. And, and my personal interpretation of what, what his hang up was, he had a little bit of power in a small group and he didn't want to give that up. That's right. Almost exactly the same thing that was happening here in the temple with these religious elite of the Jews. They didn't want to give up their power. <laughs> Let me tell you something. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it, <laughs> ain't none of us got no power. Anyway, okay? Only King Jesus has the power. <laughs> so we might as well give it up now because he's got it anyway, all right? And so, but, but there, listen, here's what I want us to make sure we understand this morning. There are church folks around us here in the Sweetwater Valley, I, I'm sure, and I'm not, I'm not really encountering a lot of it, just, just sort of maybe some implied resistance, but nothing, nothing. But I can guarantee you, you know, there's some folks around here that don't like what we're doing here at the fellowship. They, you know, they'll talk about us. They don't like the way we do our music. They may not like the way we dress when we come to church. They may not like the translations of the Bible we're preaching and teaching from. And they'll disparage us because of the way God is at work through us. You can expect that. It's going to happen. And it probably already is happening. Well, what do we do? How do we react to this? You know, I, I, let me tell you. Let's just keep loving them. And just keep loving Jesus. That's what we need to do. Let's keep preaching the gospel and seeking to exalt Jesus and make disciples. And not only that, let's help them to preach the gospel and win people to Jesus. Because if they're preaching salvation by Jesus and His work alone by grace through faith, let by grace through faith, let's not oppose them. You know, Paul experienced some resistance, and 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 some wanted to oppose those who resisted him. But he told the Philippian church in, in, in chapter one, he said, "Some preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill." And he said. The latter do it out of love, just like the song we sang earlier. You know, we got to have that love. If we're doing it without the love, it, it don't matter. But there's a lot of folks preaching the gospel, and they don't really love people. Okay? Uh, and, but he says, but, no one, but some are preaching the gospel that do love people. He says, no one that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. He says, the former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition. You know, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. And he says, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. And so listen, what I'm saying is, let's, let's, let's look at this like the Apostle Paul. Instead of opposing those who preach the gospel, Scripture says to rejoice that they are preaching the gospel. I pray that God raises up people everywhere that preach the gospel. Let's not oppose them. In 
And so if they're opposing us, what do we do? We just keep preaching the gospel. Let's love them anyway, all right? But we can expect some resistance. This life will come from anywhere because Satan hates the gospel message and he will work through whomever will let him to oppose the work of God. Beware lest he work through you seeking to limit the number of those who hear the message of hope. So when you, when, when you seek to allow the Holy Spirit of God and His power to work through you, you'll, you'll see a few reactions. And number one is, is that you can expect some resistance. There'll be some resistance. But number two, something we see in verse four, we can also expect some repentance. <laughs> Amen? Amen? There's a good side to this. The work that God has us to do now can get tough sometimes. <laughs> but the end is oh so good. Amen. <laughs> oh, you know, I've heard somebody say that the, the, the pay is not that good, but the retirement benefits are out of this world. Amen. <laughs> and so that's what we got looked forward to. So, but we can expect some repentance. While there will be op opposition, let's not forget why we preach the gospel. Why do we share the gospel? Why do we share this truth? That souls will come to repentance and faith in Jesus. That's why we preach it. That's why we share the gospel. The prophet Isaiah wrote in chapter 55, he says, For as the rain and snow come down from heaven and don't return up there, but they water the earth and they make it sprout and they give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, he says, So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose it and it shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Amen. <laughs> And so we can go with confidence when we go with the gospel as we preach the word of God that God will work through it to accomplish what he desires. Romans chapter 8 verse 28 says that, that God is working together uh, for good. All, uh, working together good for all those who are called according to his purpose. And those of us who are at work through the power of the Holy Spirit in us uh, let's not grow weary in well-doing. Let's continue to press on with confidence, knowing that God is doing something through us. Amen. We might not see the results. In Acts chapter 4, verse 4, we read, But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. 5,000 men believed. That word for believe is the same as faith. So they had faith under repentance. Some count this number, 5,000, as including the 120 in the upper room, plus 3,000 on the day of Pentecost, plus whatever number have believed since then. And, 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 and that all adds up to 5,000 men. But since they counted men, some say that you know, it didn't count the women and children, so you can estimate as much as 15 or 20,000 and, and who believed in the temple, you know, there in Solomon's porch. And I wasn't there, so I can't say for sure how we arrive at the number 5,000 here, but for the glory of God, think about what's happening here. These unlearned and ignorant men and women are filled with the Holy Spirit of God, and they're preaching the gospel, and over 5,000 people have turned away from sin and self and unto Jesus and believed and are redeemed and have fellowship with the Father forevermore. Oh, man. That's what's happening. Oh, man. God at work. All we have to do is tell the story. Tell the story of Jesus. Tell the story. God will do the work. Adoniram Judson traveled to Burma in the early 19th century and he labored to preach the gospel for five years before he saw his first convert. He preached the gospel and preached the gospel and loved on people and preached the gospel and loved on people for five years before one person believed. 
I tell you, I'd quit. <laughs> I don't know if I could do it for five years. You know, I mean, whew, how could he do that? But, but, but all I'm saying to you is, we don't know what, what, what the harvest is going to be and when it's going to be. That's true. We just got to scatter the seeds. Throw those seeds up there. God will give the increase. For five years, Adoram Judson preached before he, kept, before he saw his first comfort, but he kept preaching. And before he died, there were 7,000 Christians in Burma with 63 churches and 163 missionaries. <laughs> God had given the increase in his time and in his way. We just got to tell the story. Tell the story. God does the work. 1 Corinthians 3, 7 through 9 says, So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor, for we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. So we are fellow laborers. And God is working through us. And as we do, we can expect some resistance. As God works through us, we can expect some resistance. But we can also expect some repentance. We can expect some, there's going to be a heart. You know, one of one of the uh, one of the songs I really like. It's several years old now. Is "Thank You, Thank You for Giving to the Lord." What's the name of the guy? Ray Bolts. Yeah, Ray Bolts. You know, it's a it's a popular song, and it says, "You know, Thank You for Giving to the Lord." You know, he got he dreamed he went to heaven, and when he was there, you know, people were coming up to him and thanking him for giving to the Lord because I am a life that was changed. You know, we don't know what God's going to do through us. But I'll tell you this. God's at work. And He wants to work through us. I beg you to let Him. Let God work through you. He's at work. He'll accomplish what He desires. And as Jeremy comes, or as Christy comes, we're going to prepare for a time of response this morning. I want to ask you a question. We know God's at work. And I know God's at Fellowship Church. I want to ask you this. A little more personal. Is God at work through you? Is God at work through you? Are, are you walking in obedience to God? Do you have fellowship with the Father? Are you telling the story of Jesus? Are you making an impact? in your oikos, in your family, in your friends, those around you that God's placed in your circle of influence, is God working through you? you know, maybe he's, he's not. Maybe you're here this morning and, and you say, Pastor Derek, I don't even know if I have a relationship with God. Look, if that's the case, then we want to urge you right now, just, just come out of your seat, come down to this altar and kneel down here and, and, and let, just pray and give your heart and life to Jesus. Turn away from your sins. Surrender to Him as the Lord and Savior. And let God begin to work in you and through you. Will you do that this morning? Maybe you need that repentance yourself today. Come today and live. You know, if you know that you know that you know Jesus, are you faithful to make disciples? Are you being faithful? Look, maybe today you're convicted because you're not you're not making disciples and you're not even trying. You're not you're not telling the story. You're not loving people. You're not you're not trying to make an impact. And if that's your heart today, and, and God's convicting you of that, repent of that and, and commit and, and ask God to reveal to you those people that He's called you to reach and go to them and find them into your home and, 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 and start reading the Bible together and praying with them and praying for them. Don't give up walking in God's ways. Keep preaching the gospel. God will accomplish what He wants to accomplish. Will you trust Him today? God's speaking to your heart right now. I ask you to stand with me. Let's respond to the truth of God's word today. Father, we come before you right now. God, we pray that you would have your way in every heart. God, I pray right now that sinners would come to repentance, faith, and God, that uh, your children would commit allowing you to work through them. We ask it in Jesus' name.
Come on as we sing. If God's speaking to your heart right now, don't put it on.